name is Tashima Dukes. I'm a former foster child. Um, so I wanna tell you guys my personal experience in the foster care system. And then I wanna give you guys the opportunity to um, ask me any questions you like that you feel may help you in your journey. Okay, and no question is, you know, too personal. That's okay. generous. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, I actually started out in foster care um, when I was about nine years old, and my family was in the military. So we, we my, my stepdad was stationed in San Diego, California. And one day, I had a really big argument with my mom prior to going to school. And there was a, there was a certain pair of pants I really, really wanted to wear. Um, and my mom said no. So my mom, she took a billy club and she almost broke my leg. So that particular day, I went to school. And when I got to school, one of the social workers met me at the front door and um, that was, you know, I had to explain what happened and that was probably the first, you know, CPS call. Um, so a call was made out to Child Protective Services and before the day was out, my sister and I were, we were both taken away from our home. Um, my biological mom was on drugs and one of the things she would have us do is she would have us cut these little squares out of the, the screen door. And she would use those squares of the screen, you know, as a filter for her crack pipe. Um, so that particular day, my sister and I, we get placed into foster care. And um, one of the major problems in the foster care system sometimes is that there aren't a lot of homes available for, for children like us. So at the time, we ended up going to a shelter. We ended up going to a shelter for two weeks because there was no house available for us to go to. And when there was a house available, we got to go to a woman's home, which was a temporary foster home. So we went there for about 30 days. After going to the temporary foster home, we went to a permanent foster home where we stayed there for about three years. Um, so, there was a call placed to family members to see who could actually take us. And actually, I didn't know this until I became an adult. Um, that correspondence was sent to uh, my father, you know, or at the time, because there are eight possible men who could be my biological father. So they were looking for someone, you know, to kind of take us. So my grandmother stepped up to the plate and she became a kinship care parent for my sister and I. And my grandmother basically said, yes, you know, bring my grandchildren after we had been in foster care for about three years. Um, so my grandmother lived in Florida. I was born and raised in Florida. So we got to Florida and I'm about 12. So I lived with my grandmother for about two years. And one day my grandmother called my mom, my biological mom, and she said, you need to come and get your children. You know, I, I don't want to keep them forever. I'm not, I don't, I'm not here to take that responsibility away from you. So my mother showed up with my stepfather and my sister and I, we were put in the car and we were driven to Philadelphia. So my sister's a lot older than I am. And my sister asked my grandmother if she could go back with her after spending the summer. Um, my sister didn't get along with my stepfather. Um, there was constant arguing and bickering. And she ended up going back to Pensacola, Florida. Whereas I stayed, I stayed with my mother and stepfather. So one day, um, after coming home from school, uh, I realized that my mother and stepfather were breaking up. And I talk about this in my book, it's called Seven Hours, where it's the seven hours that I spent outside my house 
Um, and I remember sitting on the steps crying, and we actually lived in off-base housing, if you guys know military. Um, so we lived in off-base housing. So I sat on the steps crying because I remember climbing up on the steps and realizing that my mother and stepfather had both relocated to another state without me. Um, so I sat on the steps and I remember the military police came to get me um, after sitting on the steps. And I ended up going to a friend's house that day. I went to a friend's house and I stayed with her and her mother until you know I could figure things out. And I was a teenager at this time. Um, so I was a teenager and what I wanted to do was become an emancipated minor. And I remember going to court and trying to advocate for myself to become an emancipated minor. And unfortunately, it didn't happen for me. I ended up, my, my, my friend's mother said that she didn't want to get in trouble with the military and she said that she did not want me to um, continue to stay in their home. So she started looking through the newspaper and she started looking for like a room for rent or an apartment for me. So at the time, I was in high school, I worked two jobs, I worked for the City of Philadelphia Law Department as an intern, um, um, as a paid intern, and I also worked at Walmart. So I did have income, so I ended up getting a room for rent, and I paid a, an elderly woman about $8 a day to live in her home. So I went to the Law Academy for Criminal Justice and Public Administration, that was my high school, and I really, really, really wanted to become a lawyer. One day, um, my teacher came to me and she needed a signature for um, a field trip. I can't remember exactly what the signature for, was for, but it was the time when I was honest and I said, I don't have anyone to sign it. And I could have easily forged my mom's name and kept it moving. But I ended up telling her, I don't have anyone to sign it. And once again, I got you know, sent down to the counselor's office and Child Protective Services was called, and I got placed back into the foster care system. And what was different for me is the fact that I, I was now a teenager. Children who are you know, older are a lot difficult to place, um, especially most of the foster parents, I mean, they're looking for babies, they're looking for young people, and here I am, this sassy teenager, you know, who has been extremely parentified and extremely independent. And there was very little you could tell me about anything, you know, because right now I'm the queen of the world and I know everything. So um, by the time I had aged out, I would already been in 13 different foster homes. Um, and I had been to so many different foster homes that um, all of the placements that I could possibly be placed in, in Philadelphia at that time, all of those placements, I had blown out of them. And there was nothing else available. And they were getting ready to send me out of state. So this elderly woman, she steps up to the plate and she says, I will take her. She says, I will take her. Um, and I ended up, you know, living in her house. And it was a really, it was a good placement compared to, um, compared to some of the other placements. And let me tell you the difference. Um, when I was in a temporary foster home, I knew the difference between me as a foster child and the biological children. And let me tell you how I knew. I knew because of the shoes that I had on my feet. So number one, I remember that the foster mom, she used to buy Nikes for her children. And I remember this one day, she ended up buying my sister and I a pair of Pro Keds. You guys know Pro Keds? I'm dating myself, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so she buys me this pair of Pro, -Ked, Pro Keds, and I used to think that that was, it was such a big deal for me. And I remember, I used to, they were white and pink, pink and white. So I used to take um, polish, shoe polish, 
and every day, you know, if there was a scuff mark on them, I would, you know, make them white again. And I remember one day I was at school and the kids, I mean, just, they would tease me to death. And I realized, oh my God, I'm wearing a pair of cheap shoes versus what the foster mom actually bought for her own biological children. So that's how I knew. So when I got to this last placement and I'm with the foster mom, one of the things she used to um, say was, call me grandma, you know, and that was different. Um, and I believe that, that I was extremely um, hypervigilant because I had been in so many different placements. So I used to listen to people's phone calls, you know, kind of like, uh, earlier, we talked about the note, the kid with the notepad. I was extremely hyper vigilant in the sense that if someone came, um, you know, if there was a phone call with a social worker or you know someone, I would listen so that I could prepare, like preparing my heart, like oh my God, I'm now moving to another foster home today. So um, I just, you know, this last placement was different. Um, and the thing is, I was 17 years old by then. And I always wondered, um, you know, I wanted to be, when I aged out, I wanted a normal life. You know, we talk a lot about normalcy. Mm -hmm. So as a student who was 17 years old, I had a social worker that would come to my school and it was the most embarrassing thing in the world. You know, especially for, you know, a sassy, you know, fashionable teenager that I was. So, um, and this social worker, nothing was confidential. And I just remember one day we were on the bus and she couldn't stop talking. She was yapping away. And I felt like, oh my God, everybody on this bus is going to know that I'm in foster care. That was number one. And number two, every time she would come into the um, to the school, she would have this huge badge on. And that was embarrassing for me because it reminded me that I was different, right? So, um, I was actually on honor roll. Um, I had received scholarships, um, White Williams. I had received scholarships from everywhere. And I actually went to school in a cohort. And I think that's, that's one of the things that really helped me. Um, I don't know if they do that in other schools, but I started with the same kids that I, that I you know, for the full time. Um, and everyone knew me, and I mean, it was a great support system for me. And I felt like school was my number one outlet in terms of, you know what, I can actually come here and escape, you know, the craziness, you know, that's going on at home. So everyone was applying to college. And I mean, I was on honor roll and I think I was, I enjoyed school and I, and I definitely loved learning. Um, but I never thought in my head that I would even, you know, go to college. Um, and my, my best friend, she actually got accepted to Pen Pennsylvania State University. Um, she was on scholarship, you know, and I felt like you know what, if I don't step up and actually start applying to some of these colleges, then, you know, I'm probably just gonna be left behind. So I started applying and I mean, I got accepted, I accepted, you know, all over the place. So the one of the eight men, one of the eight possible men who, you know, was my biological father, he ended up calling my foster home and I had a conversation with him about, you know, the fact that I was getting ready to age out, um, the fact that I hated being in foster care, and he talked about the fact that he was giving um, child support to my mother, and he ended up co-signing for an apartment for me, um, which was, you know, not far from where Penn State is. Um, so the day before my 18th birthday, this foster mom uh, while everyone was asleep, I would load everything that I owned into his truck. 
and I was getting ready to start school at Penn State where I where I you know chosen to go and been accepted and I just decided that I didn't want anything to do with foster care you know we talked about that earlier um, you know how someone feels about the foster care system however the foster care would have been the best thing for me and my um, foster mom was advocating for me to um, to go into independent living which is a program that you can go into when you're getting ready to age out and I could have gotten housing but I didn't want to wait on a waiting list and I felt like I was an adult and I wanted to turn a, a totally a totally new leaf and be normal so I ran away and when I got to Penn State I would have a social worker um, call my advisor she would call my advisor every day and she says you know you're not um, you're not discharged you know you need to come back things like that and I would say things like catch me if you can <laughs> right <laughs> so I continued in foster care um, however um, you know that statistic where we talk about um, 50% of those children, is it 50% end up homeless? No, 50% uh, of the homeless population spent some time in foster care. So I became homeless. And I remember the apartment people talking to um, my supposed to be biological father about whether or not, you know, he was going to foot the bill for me not being able to pay the rent. So I was able to recover from that. And I ended up graduating um, from college. But let me, let me just backtrack because um, an important thing was I remember starting college, my first day of orientation. You guys know um, orientation. This is your first day of college. And I remember sitting in a lecture hall. I was sitting in a lecture hall with 300 people, 300 families. And they were all there, including my best friend and her mother. And they were all there to support um, the children that were in foster care. Or not in foster care, but they were there to support their children. And I just remember it was the, it should have been, you know, the best day of my life. And this was my idea of becoming normal. And I remember it being like the worst day of my life. And it was the worst day of my life because I remember being reminded of not having a family. And I remember sitting there by myself and all of a sudden I just started crying my eyes out as I looked around and I saw everybody there with their family. So the day I started to graduate, I was graduating from Pennsylvania State University and once again it was, you know, supposed to be the best day of my life and I just remember my mom showing up and her cheesing for the camera and I was so annoyed because I felt like at the time I needed her I needed her there in the beginning not when you know all the work has been done you know you're there to celebrate so you know that's kind of what happened with that but I ended up um, my first job I started working with children um, with, with special needs and I remember one day, my car breaks down on the, hall, on the highway, and I'm walking off of the highway, and I remember a girl, the girl that, you know, kind of gave me a ride home that day, we became friends. And one day, she sends me this, this text about um, possi a possible um, job, you know, that I could take. And, you know, I had been working with children with special needs for a long time, but I decided to apply for this job. So I apply and you know what? It was so crazy because I have on this, um, I, I didn't even have on like the, the proper like interview color, like I should have on blue, but I remember having on this green suit with a flower in my hair. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was totally out there. And I remember getting hired on the spot. So I became a social worker um, and I had a caseload of like 20 children. And I later realized that I was now working 
for the same foster care agency that placed me in foster care. And it was so amazing for me, you know, to now be on the other side and to be supporting children in foster care at the same agency. So I continued to work in foster care and I continued to support children. And one day I had a little girl who had been sexually abused and I just remember this little girl telling everyone about her experience. And as a result, I decided one day, I said, I would like to write a book about my experience in foster care. And I just, I remember getting so much pushback, especially from my biological family. Because I remember the very first person I would tell is my sister Amanda. So I remember calling her. And Amanda has really, really been an amazing, she, she's been like a sister keeper. You know what I'm saying? So number one, she's been such a support. So I've never been in a fight in my life, believe it or not, because you know everyone knew me as Amanda's sister. And Amanda will definitely beat you up if you mess up <laughs> mess around with her sister. You know what I'm saying? And one of the things that we never really talked about, we never really talked about our experience in foster care together. Um, and I, I just remember this one day, um, I was nine years old, and I just remember my mother's um, boyfriend coming over to the house one day. And I don't, I don't even know why we answered the door, because usually mom says, don't answer the phone, you know, don't do this, don't do that, right? I don't even know why we answered the door, but I remember this guy coming in and with the idea that he was going to harm me as the little person. And I remember him pushing me down on the bed, but I just remember my sister, it's, it's almost like she could sense that something was wrong. He ended up giving her money to go to the store. And I remember looking out the window and I could see my sister running like she was Jackie Joyner Kirsty. And she ran to the store, and before this man could just take my innocence away, my sister was running back through the front door. And the next time this guy, it's almost like he knew when my mother was not home. So the next time he tried to come back through the door, we didn't answer. And I remember us two little people hiding under the bathroom cabinet. And just, it's like one of those things to this day, it's like one of those unspoken things, like we never talked about it, you know what I mean? But it's, I've always known her to be that protector for me. So this particular day, I was really disappointed that she did not want to share her experience in foster care. And for me, I, I've been working in foster care for a long time, and the foster care is really all I know. So my sister says, you know, I don't want to talk about it. And she said, if you do, then, you know, and you publish the book, I'll sue. So I was real, I was just really sad. So, and I had to go through all these different measures because I feel like this is a story that needs to be told. Um, hence the title, Truth Be Told. Um, because many of our family members always believed that we were living with a family friend. And when they found out, you know, that we were in foster care, um, I mean, people were just shocked and surprised. So I wanted to title this Truth Be Told because I always hear people say the word, you know, and truth be told. And I feel like it's a, you're gossiping, but usually the truth kind of comes out. You say how you really feel when you say it. So um, that's kind of been my journey. I ended up publishing the book and not realizing that this book has really just kind of taken me on a national and inter now international journey. Um, and how many children we actually support and how many trainings, how many foster parents we actually support that are in the foster care system. I, um, I asked Shima to come in and share her story. Most children who grow up in foster care um, I don't know if they feel as comfortable, you know, to, to come up and to share.
share their story, and I think it's important, and that's why I asked her to come, so that you guys could hear firsthand, you know, somebody who's gone through it and has come out on the other side, and not just come out on the other side, but have come out, you know, really successful in it. So I'm thank thankful for you for coming and sharing your story. Any questions you guys have for me? Any yeah. comments, concerns? Did you have any mentors along the way that really made a difference, like outside of the home, like whether it be teachers or anything like that? Um, I don't feel like I had a mentor. Um, I feel like a lot of the children that were in the classroom with me, I felt like they were a great support for me. Um, when I aged, before I aged out of the system, I was in a program which, which is independent living, but it was called the Achieving Independence Center. And I felt like a lot of those people actually believed in me so they did a lot of college, um, you know, letters for me. Um, and also they supported, you know, the money and the financial support that I needed in order to apply to a lot of those different colleges, you know, money that I didn't have. What do you think was the worst part about growing up in foster care, despite not having, you know, a mom or a dad? Um, the worst part of growing up in foster care is was for me um, being with someone that doesn't really love you and that's probably the hardest part and knowing that this person you know is really in this for financial gain so one of the things when when i'm training i always talk about number one to never threaten children with not having a family and i feel like i see that so often um, and foster parents often say, I'm going, I'm going to take you back to the, the office or I'm going to drop you off or you're going to be removed from my home. So that is difficult um, because you're already hyper vigilant and you see so many people in your life. There are social workers coming through your life. There are psychiatrists, psychologists. There's so many different people and you know like that clipboard effect you know we see these people they're coming in some people are just coming in and they're documenting there's no real connection and i just remember as a social worker you know my first year as a social worker was it was like the worst thing ever and one of the things we used to have every monday morning it uh, monday was the pits you know and if there was a day of the week that you wanted to call out it's always monday so we would have foster parents come into the agency and drop off children. Mm -hmm. So we would have our entire front lobby mm -hmm. filled with trash bags. You know, so not only are you dropped off, but you're dropped off in a trash bag, which is the worst. So what do you think, um, you know, our program is so much about being that love. What do you think would have been the greatest thing for you as a child is to have somebody say I love you? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, I believe that that's important. Also the connection, yeah. you know, to have a person that comes in that's vested yes. and says, you know, I'm not here for a check. Yeah. I'm here because I love you and I want to support you and I want to see you succeed. That's so important. don't be afraid to tell your kids that you love them. You know, um, I think that there's maybe an awkwardness, you know, um, but don't be afraid to give your heart to that child and to say that you love them because chances are they've never heard that before. I mean, I'd see my six teenage boys and I would kiss them on the cheek and I would grab their faces and I would look them in the eye and I would say to them, I love you. You're so special to me. And, you know, some of them would say it back and some of them would just look at me like you're crazy, you know. And I would do it every time I would leave because I wanted them to feel that love and know that love. Um, so I don't want you guys to be afraid to build those kind of connections. Did you have a hard time growing it back and working in the system that you had been brought up in? I mean, because you were talking about like feeling normal and getting, you know, mm -hmm. wanting to be out of the system. So then to go back to it after, you know, going to school, was that hard? Or? Well, I was excited to be there. 
-hmm. and I felt like I'm on the other side. Yeah. You know, and I'm here to help other people. So it was it was very interesting to see, you know, the type of impact I had on a child mm -hmm. after I said to that child, I was also in foster care. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would see eyes light up, mm -hmm. you know, like you understand me, mm -hmm. you know. So I was excited about that. Um, but I realized that some of the things that stayed with me, um, maybe I wouldn't stay at a job long. Um, also, if I came into an office, I never really, um, I wouldn't decorate my office. You know, one of those things like, I don't know how long I'm going to be here. You know, so I never really personalized it. You know, and, it, you know, I became a guidance counselor. And um, the principal, um, I, the principal actually put that on my evaluation that um you know my space was not decorated you know so it was one of those things i, I don't even know that i was conscious of it mm -hmm. you know until after the fact so it sounds like you you didn't have an advocate as a child in the foster system do you feel like that's do you feel like the system is changing for the better at all or are you seeing are you in terms of having advocates for yeah, children I, mean, I think that austin angels is changing the system for the better um yes <laughs> yeah i mean being able to have advocates you know and people who um are out there you know to really help and to support children in foster care i believe that um i do see people like casa and i want i always wondered like after the fact in retrospect why why didn't i ever have a casa worker <laughs> You know, someone to be sworn in by a judge and kind of go to court and say, this is how we're going to advocate for this young lady. But I never, I never had that. How's your relationship with your sister now since the book did come out and she was so opposed to it? You know, I feel like she and I used to be extremely close and we were really close, especially around the time we were in foster care. But I think when she went home, um, and she lived with my grandmother. I was, I think I was resentful, you know, almost like you left me. She didn't protect Absolutely. So, um, but we still talk, you know, we, we may not be as close as we were, but we still talk. And I mean, there's only two of us. I only have one sister, Amanda. Um, what about your mom mm -hmm. and your dad that co-signed for you? Where, what's... Um, so I do, I talk to my mom. I, I talk to her all the time. Does she get clean? I would hope so. Yeah. Um, but I believe that some people are functional addicts mm. and they're able to hide it well. But my uh, the, that's the hope is that now she is clean. Um, as for the guy that co-signed, um, I remember him picking me up one day and I was on break. So he ended up driving me to Atlanta and I met his family for the first time and I was so excited. And his sister lived in this beautiful, beautiful house in Atlanta. Um, and I just remember, you know, trying to settle into that. And he ended up giving my mother his um, credit card information and she wiped out his bank account. And they had this heated argument where he says, she said, you know, this is not your daughter anyway. Mm -hmm. And he would never take my phone calls after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even when we were going through litigation with the apartment, um, I mean, he would barely like pick up the phone, you know, unfortunately. Yep. So how do you think you healed from that time? Um, well, I think, I think I have, I've become a therapist, you know, I have three master's degrees. So I think reading about psychology and also anyone who is working with someone else, you know, you have to, you know, get your own treatment so that you work on your own trauma mm -hmm. and whatever that is. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think. I think I fared, you know, pretty well. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Yep. So, how's your sister doing? She 
My sister's in the helping profession. She's a traveling nurse. Okay. She has two children. Um, she, I mean, she'll probably be a part of this hurricane, mm -hmm. you know, whoever needs nursing assistance, things like that. So she's done really, really well as also. Yep. So how do you think you can empower these women as they leave here today and they go back home and they're gonna start supporting children? What, mm -hmm. what piece of advice could you give them? The biggest piece of advice um, you know, is to give love, you know, I, and I don't think it's anything deep, you know what I mean? You know, I don't think it's theological, you know, it's not profound or, you know, but I think on a, on a basic level, the families that you support, the children, the families, they need your love and your consistency. Um, let me tell you that I, me and foster care, I've moved all over the place. I've been with a bunch of different families, a bunch of respite families. And what you don't see is consistency. You know, today I could see a social worker and tomorrow I could see a totally different social worker. And sometimes you have to be that consistent person that supports children in foster care, you know? And, and if you're able to move with that family, just, you know, we talked about, you know, how the program works here, being able to move wherever that child has moved and continue to support them, I think it's, it's huge. It's huge. You know, because children in foster care, not only are they gonna change homes, they're gonna change schools, and their environment is going to change all the time. So, if I'm in a new school and I see a, a, an, an old face, a consistent face coming in, that would be huge for me. Even in a new home, you know, knowing that I have your support and I have your love, that being that connection, I believe will be a tremendous help to children in foster care. That's good. That's good. And the hope is that if we do our program and the families feel supported and the children feel loved, and they're less likely to move. Mm -hmm. And we see that in our program, and that's what UT is researching right now. Because families and children that are in our program, they're not moving from home to home to home to home to home. Mm -hmm. They are staying in placement longer. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about why you move so often? Mm -hmm. Well, um, in the beginning, when I first entered the foster care system, I didn't have a place to live. I mean. I, I was taken from my mother and I was immediately placed into a shelter because there were no homes available. And then from there, I was sent to a temporary foster home for 30 days. Uh, so, I mean, that was the way the program was designed in California. It's temporary and then it's permanent. Um, and I was taken in by the temporary foster mother because, you know, she had only agreed to keep us for 30 days. We got placed into a permanent foster home where you know where I stayed for three years, and then we were reunified. And what was that like? That placement. For the the last years? one. I remember the bells. Um, it. I. I don't remember it being a bad thing. I do remember acting out. I remember, you know, just missing my family. Yeah. You know, being away from them. I remember that. I don't remember anything bad about the Bells. You know, like if I saw them on the street right now, you know, I'd probably give them a hug and say, thanks, you know, for the work that you've oh, done. Oh, that was their last name, the Bells. The Bells. <laughs> I was thinking the Bells. Yes. Bells. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it was Bells. But then as, an, as a teenager, I think it's, it's a lot harder to place. Um, when I first got into foster care, I was placed in a woman's basement. And this particular lady, she wanted more kids upstairs in the house. So she was utilizing her basement. So I was in a cold, wet, disgusting basement, you know, because she wanted to have more money, you know, to fill the other rooms. Um, and I talk about that in my book, Roaches in My Bed. You know, I'm coming home to this, you know, to these water bugs. Um, and I was moved because I spoke out about it. And I, I remember, I mean, first of all, I was extremely parentified. I was extremely independent. 
I had already been living on my own, paying my own bills. Um, so I felt like they put me in a worse place, you know, and I, and I would have no problems letting the social worker know that. Listen, I can go back to living in a room, you know, in someone's home, and I can take care of myself a lot better than you guys. And a lot of times, because I voiced that, because I was this um, sassy, independent, outspoken, outspoken teenage girl, you know, and I would look up my rights, you know, and I would let them know. So, and I remember, um, I remember Robin Mulder was my, my so social worker, and I just remember calling her one day saying, please get me out of here. Um, I was placed in a home um, where they, the religious practice, they were Muslims, and they were forcing me to, uh, you know, to participate, you know, and I hated it, you know. What do you, how come you think, um, or what do you think, like, you know, we hear about these bad foster parents, mm -hmm. um, what do you think could be done about uh, well, when I became a social worker, that particular lady was still a foster parent, and I that the first call of duty was for me to shut her house down. Yeah, you know, and, and a lot of you have to speak out and you have to advocate for the children that you work with. Yeah. So if you see injustice, you have to make it known. You know, because a lot of times the children that we support they're not necessarily going to be as vocal as I was. Well, I was going to say, I would think that 98% of children will not call their caseworker and say, get me out of here. Well, I mean, but, and also, you, you may get yourself in a situation where you say, you know what, I really don't want to move to another home. That's right. So I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, because that's worse if you don't know what's on the other side. Right. How many homes do you believe in a percentage basis? Out of a hundred percent of homes out there, what percentage do you think are, in your experience, like bad homes? Well, I think that they're out there. I don't know what the percentage is, but I believe that they're out there. And what what we're seeing right now, I know in Philadelphia where I am right now, right now we're in a major deficit. We're in a deficit for um, just we don't, there aren't homes available. They're, right now, the city is trying to recruit three hundred foster parents. And unfortunately, I believe that when you get in a desperate situation, you'll turn your eye. You'll or you'll eye. take anybody. Yeah. And I believe a lot of the um, parents that come in, I believe that they are in it for financial gain. I mean, we're seeing more and more people um, in the foster care system, and they're, they're on SSI, or and they're doing it really to supplement their income. Yeah. And I always, always, always tell people, listen, you cannot you're, you're not going to get rich, and you are not going to make enough money, you know, to be wealthy by taking care of these children. And depending on what level of care this child is on, I mean, you're probably going to get $13 a day. Yeah. So don't create additional trauma for a child in foster care, you know, because you want to make some extra bucks, like get a paper route, yeah. start selling popcorn, you know, do something else and not hurt these children again.